In this video, we're gonna talk about what to look for in a stock before buying. I'm gonna tell you the number one most important thing to look at before buying. We're gonna also look at a company that I think right now fits the criteria of being a pretty good investment. And if you stick to the end, I'm gonna give you a second thing to look for before buying a company's stock. But before I just lay it on you, I kinda need to walk you through a little bit of a lesson on business and what makes a business great. Because in stock investing, there's really two ways that you can go about it. The options that you have are either to buy businesses that are sort of just okay, but to buy them at extremely discounted low prices, or to buy really great businesses and to buy them at a price that isn't necessarily a crazy low price, but is at least a decently fair price. And of course, if you can buy a really great business at a crazy low price, that's even better. But great businesses don't often get that cheap. Now this whole thing of okay businesses at great prices versus great businesses at okay prices is the essence behind the popular quote from Warren Buffett when he says that it's better to buy a wonderful business at a fair price than a fair business at a wonderful price. But what makes a business wonderful? So the main thing is that it has some sort of advantage over the competition that allows it to maintain and grow its market share of customers without being required to lower prices in order to gain additional market share. Having a competitive advantage is also what prevents competition from simply coming in, copying the business model, and then just lowering their prices a little bit and stealing away customers. Now, if a company is profitable right now, then it means that they do have some sort of competitive advantage that allows them to be profitable currently. And that's even if you don't necessarily know what that competitive advantage even is. However, some competitive advantages are more durable and more sustainable than others. So when you hear people talk about analyzing companies, you'll hear them talk about quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis. Quantitative analysis is all about the numbers. Really, how much does the company make and how much is it gonna to cost to buy it? But also how much is the company gonna make in the future and what is the present value of those future cash flows today? But that's where we begin to cross over with qualitative analysis. Because qualitative analysis is really all about considering how strong the company's competitive advantage actually is and how long the business is likely to live on for. Will the business still be around in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years? And will it be still as profitable as it is now or will competition have come in and competed all the profits away? Or will some new technology make the business model obsolete? And if so, how long do we have? And what might all that even look like? That's why Buffett, by the way, likes very simple companies like a company like Coca-Cola, because a company like Coca-Cola is likely to still be doing their thing for quite a long time. Now, speaking of Warren Buffett, something that Buffett says is that buying Berkshire Hathaway was actually a mistake. See, Berkshire Hathaway was originally a textile manufacturing company, and it was a business that was in a highly competitive industry. Now, he did pay an extremely cheap price for his shares of Berkshire, basically a price that was significantly below what the company could actually be liquidated for. But once he purchased enough shares to gain a controlling interest over the company, he did not go ahead and liquidate the company. But what he did do is he began to allocate the profits that it was generating towards purchasing better businesses. So another popular quote from Warren Buffett that you may have heard is that should you find yourself in a chronically leaking boat, energy devoted to changing vessels is likely to be more productive than energy devoted to patching leaks. See, the textile manufacturing business was a leaking boat, so to speak. And while the previous management of the business before Buffett gained control was using profits towards essentially patching leaks and keeping the textile business afloat, once Buffett had control, he was instead devoting profits towards changing boats, or in other words, changing businesses. Some money was reinvested back into Berkshire, the textile manufacturing business, for a little while, but eventually, and pretty quickly, it didn't make any sense to put any more money into the textile manufacturing business. And the reason for that was simply that the returns that could be achieved by investing money into the textile manufacturing business were not that good compared to the other places that money could be allocated. 
And so instead, money got allocated towards wherever it would get the highest returns. And eventually what happened was the profits that were coming in from the better businesses that he was accumulating within Berkshire eventually basically completely eclipsed the profits that were coming in from the textile manufacturing business. And eventually from there, the textile business was actually just closed down altogether. One of the main lessons that Buffett learned from this whole entire experience is that he didn't want anything to do with low quality businesses ever again. So that's a great lesson for us to take away from his experience, but there's also another lesson here. Berkshire, the textile business died, right? But Berkshire, the company, ended up growing to be one of the largest companies in the world. And this happened because Warren Buffett understood capital allocation and was able to invest the profits from the dying business at high rates of return. Each dollar of capital was allocated towards where it would achieve the best returns. So that's pretty cool, right? And are you seeing how being a good investor and being a good capital allocator are kind of one and the same thing. So this now leads us to the number one thing that you're gonna to wanna to look for when searching for companies that you want to invest in, which is consistently high returns on invested capital. See, when a company makes a profit, the management of that company, usually the CEO, must decide how to best use that money. That money is technically yours because you own the company, or at least a portion of it is depending on how many shares you own. But the management decides the best way to allocate it on your behalf. Some companies choose to distribute a portion of the profits that are made to the shareholders as a dividend, in which case that money is put back into your pocket for you to figure out what to do with it. And for you as an individual, that would usually mean finding a new place to invest that money. If you're a stock investor, it would mean finding a new stock to buy with that money. And of course, you'd be looking for the stock investment that has the highest expected returns. Or potentially it could even mean paying down debt if that happened to make the most sense depending on the investments available at the time and the interest rate on your debt. As a side note here, if you have 18% credit card debt, for example, then it doesn't make any sense to invest until that 18% credit card debt is paid off. Unless, of course, you have an investment opportunity that guarantees a higher than 18% return, but that's not gonna happen. So from a capital allocation standpoint, it just makes sense to pay off the 18% debt before you invest. But with that said, if you have a mortgage with a rate of 3%, then it's actually gonna make more sense to invest money than it would be to put more money towards paying down your mortgage faster. And that's just because you're gonna be able to get a much better than a 3% return on your investment. Again, this is just a capital allocation decision, right? So nonetheless, as for the money that's not distributed to you as a dividend, it's left to the company's management to decide how to best allocate that capital on your behalf. Basically, how to best allocate that capital for you. Again, it's your money, even though it's not paid out to you as a dividend, but the company allocates that portion of it for you. What this means is that the company's management has become, in a way, your money manager. You've essentially subcontracted out your job of figuring out what to invest your money into to the management of the company, which is pretty cool, especially if the company has a good track record and good opportunities for reinvesting that capital. So let's look at the company Home Depot, for example. Their stock has a price to earnings ratio of just over 23. So they're definitely not incredibly cheap by price to earnings ratio standards, but they're also not extraordinarily overpriced either. And to put that price to earnings ratio into perspective for you, the PE ratio of the S&P 500 as a whole right now is sitting at around 46. But now let's look at how they've done with returns on invested capital, because that's what we're really talking about here. So over the years, we can see that Home Depot has been pretty great at allocating capital. And if Home Depot can keep this up for another 20 or 30 years, then it's gonna mean that Home Depot is a great investment at this price. But if Home Depot, however, only has another five years of being able to reinvest capital at this rate, then it would mean that buying this stock at this price becomes really not quite so appealing. And this is really where the qualitative analysis part comes in. So their main competitor, Home Depot's main competitor is Lowe's. So when doing a qualitative analysis, you might wanna ask yourself things like, which of these companies is the better company and why? And which one will be the better company in 10 years from now? And why? And could a third company come in and start gaining market share? And what is it that's preventing that from happening? Now, one of the ways that Home Depot is reinvesting capital is by using profits to open new locations. But what happens when the world is fully saturated with Home Depot locations 
and it's no longer profitable to keep opening new locations. Will management still be as good at allocating capital as they are now? Now Home Depot, by the way, is just an example that I thought would be a good company for the point of this video. I do think it's a decent investment right now, given the other opportunities available, and I would definitely rather buy Home Depot stock than I would wanna buy the entire S&P 500 index. Making predictions about the future of a business is more of an art than a science. It's something that comes more from business savviness than it does from having the ability to play with numbers in a spreadsheet. Now, knowing how to do the quantitative side of things is great, and it definitely is a necessity that you understand the idea behind the intrinsic value calculation and the time value of money, but understanding the things that makes a business amazing and long enduring is just as important or even more important. Remember though, Buffett took over a lousy textile manufacturing business and look at what he did with it. And that was because of awesome capital allocation skills. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that if the main takeaway from this video is that the number one thing to look for is high returns on invested capital being sustained consistently over time, then the second main takeaway from this video is that you should keep your eye out for a company with great management and great ability to allocate capital. Now, how can can you tell? Well, seeing consistent and sustained high returns on invested capital is one way to tell in and of itself, but another way can be reading through current and past letters to shareholders and trying to get a sense of whether management gets it or doesn't. If you're finding that management is very focused on maximizing long-term per share intrinsic value, that can be a really great sign. Sometimes they'll literally spell it out that that is what their main focus is. And by yourself being someone that does get it, then you're gonna be able to better tell when others do or don't also get it. And as you go through your investing career, what you're gonna notice is that a lot of CEOs don't actually get it. And that maximizing long-term per share intrinsic value is not the priority of many CEOs. Now, another way of getting a good hint of a CEO's capital allocation skills and priorities is seeing that a company is using some of their money to buy back shares. Now, this can be a great sign to see. However, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to look at when they've been doing it. Because if a company is buying back shares at times when their stock is overpriced, that's gonna be a really bad sign. And the same goes maybe even more so for seeing that a company is issuing new shares as a way of raising cash at times that the stock is undervalued. If you see that, then you should really just pass on the company completely. If you wanna learn more about qualitative analysis and the types of competitive advantages that a company can have, then I would check out this video right here next. Now, I'm not a financial advisor. I just love investing and I love helping people learn about investing. So please don't take my content as financial advice because it's not advice. But nonetheless, thank you for watching to the end and I'll see you in this next video right over here.